All right, what's going on, guys? It's Coach Gaglione here. This is another edition of the Powerlifting for the People podcast. I'm your host, Coach Gaglione. Uh, and today we got a special guest, so one of my uh, mentors, Vincent. How are you doing today? Well, John, real good, thanks. So um, for those that are kind of listening on iTunes, there's also going to be a, like a video component to this. If you also want to, you know, if you're listening to this, feel free to listen, but also uh, definitely check out the YouTube version as well. We don't always have a YouTube version, but I think there'll be kind of some visuals for this one, which I think will always be helpful. Um, but just really kind of before we kind of get in, jump into today's discussion, um, just really quick, like background of, you know, who you are. And then, you know, I, I can kind of you know, chime in and talk about like our relationship as well, but who you are and kind of what, what you got going on right now. So I started in the personal training industry in 1989, uh, coming out of or in the midst of a bodybuilding uh, journey. Um, and a powerlifting journey to a much smaller scale, uh, probably because by the time I hit the, the interest in the potential powerlifting opportunity, my body was starting to get broken down and beat up. Um, my formal education outside of my gym, what we call gym science education, right, being around the gym for decades um, and, and training with some of the biggest, strongest people I've ever met in my life, um, my formal education kind of contradicted a lot of what I had learned in the gym. Uh, so I was introduced to exercise biomechanics in 1990, um, yeah, and then pursued it uh, up through today um, through the study of resistance training specialist program. Um, I've explored other opportunities academically. Uh, I've looked at other perspectives along the way to keep my mind open and see how things converge, uh, where they, they butt heads uh, from a theoretical practical standpoint and where they merge. And I, um, I, keep, I keep coming back, you know, uh, I stopped searching, uh, you know, uh, about 15 years ago. Um, I keep coming back to RTS, right? Because uh, foundationally that's what kept me training. Uh, my understanding of exercise mechanics and neural mechanics and thinking about exercise through that platform. Um, so I'm, I'm just kind of heavily ingrained in the mechanical aspects of structure and function as it applies to any exerciser and then being able to define what exercise truly is, right? Is, is it a sport thing we're doing, we're calling exercise? Is it a mind body thing? Is it a resistance application thing? Um, so really it's about the study in, uh, of structure and function and opportunity and conditions of the human body and what we expose it to. Yeah. So we, we've been, you know, I've been in the certification part of the personal training industry for 26 years, um, taught over at Hofstra for up in from 96 to 2020, doing a little work now at NYIT. And um, APTE is now really uh, my focus is continuing education and advancement of education of those who are really seeking, um, and I, I mean this humbly, a, a deeper understanding of the human body. Um, everybody can talk about reps and sets and everybody can use gym language and everybody gets results. And, and really what does it come down to, right? Sustainability, um, function of your body, the ability for it to function optimally on all levels, right? Not, not just from a, a power or a composition standpoint, but like this integrative holistic approach to, hey, I want to be strong for life, you know? Uh, so that's our focus. Excellent. So I'll just kind of give a quick background about, uh, I guess, our relationship and kind of how, because it's, it's probably, it's been over a decade, I think, since I uh, first stumbled into your, uh, your live <laughs> course. I think it was, um, and in particular, where where my wheel started to turn. I don't know if you remember this or not. And I'm, I'm sure we've talked about it a bunch of times, but I remember when we, when we got on the flat bench for the first time, and that was like where, you know, cause I had, I'd been competing for a couple of years at that point. Um, not, you know, this is, cause like I said, this is like over 10 years ago now. And, um, you know, I think that you, uh, it was either, I think you and me, one of your instructors were teaching the barbell, like kind of chest press, just, you know, as an exercise to, uh, you know, work your, your, your pectoral muscles and all that. And, and uh, it was completely like, you know, uh, contrary to like what I was doing at the time as, as a, you know, using the bench press as a, uh, as a competition and it was completely different. And um, 
I, I really started to, um, I started to think a lot more and then over, over more courses with you and more courses with, you know, you know, RTS uh, in the future. Um, I started to kind of see a whole different perspective and just kind of understand, um, at least for me, that RTS was a really nice, like, you know, lens that I can kind of like look through and kind of analyze things better um, for like, what is this exercise actually doing? Or what is this movement actually kind of working? Uh, or what, what fibers are being stimulated? What's actually being challenged here? Uh, is the challenge appropriate for the person or is the challenge appropriate for the goal? Um, so anyways, it's been, I don't, it's, it's been great. Um, I always like enjoy like learning cause I get, uh, you know, my background, um, you know, I have a master's in education and my certification is, you know, is, is with you guys. And so all, a lot of my stuff is self-taught and what I've kind of learned through you and, you know, obviously my hands-on experience. So it's been a really cool, um, and knock on wood, um, you know, when we first met, um, I was a much bigger man. I was much, I, I was a lot unhealth, um, not as healthy, uh, but I still kind of get to do what I love. I still love competing and powerlifting. I still kind of love helping others kind of compete. And what, what, what my kind of goal is, um, a lot of our listeners, some, some may be coaches, uh, but a lot of people may be recreational lifters or they might be, might be competitive and, you know, competitive, you know, what is competitive <laughs> is, uh, is always a good question. And how competitive do you want to be? But my kind of understanding, as far as the people that I work with, is a lot of people do love to lift with the barbell and they do like to train for something. Uh, so kind of my goal is to kind of showcase, you know, what is a way that we can kind of, you know, minimize the risk but still potentially do something that you love and maybe get some, you know, if there's some aesthetic benefits or if there's some health benefits or bone density benefits that can maybe be associated with it without, you know, maybe compromising the joints like as much. So that's kind of like my goal. Uh, so maybe if um, I know that it's like, and I know you will kind of talk about, you have a course coming up for people that want to dive in a little bit deeper, sure. but mm -hmm. as far as like, what is like a bird's eye view of like, what does it mean to kind of look at exercise through the lens of a resistance training special specialist? Like, what would you say, is kind of like your cliff nose version of like what that means when you're looking at an exercise. Yeah. So, so that, you know, it's, it's always hard to dive into like where we start. So, you know, it's always the who, what, why, when, where, how need goal ability and tolerance. Like there are 10 things that just pop immediately that need to be addressed. And so how do we address these questions right on a deeper level? And so we, we rely on these five principal sciences, right, to bring in from an amalgamation standpoint and say, okay, I'm looking at the anatomy standpoint, right? And, and anatomy, if we look at it in its static position, has a function. If we look at it in a moving position, it has a function, right? So muscles line of pull changes, joint forces changes, joint angles are, are dictating joint contact surface relationships. Um, the neuromechanics of exercise. So like a deep dive into anatomy, right? A, a deep dive into physiology from a neuromuscular perspective. Uh, a deep dive into physics, right? And, and I don't mean that from like a high school physics course. I mean it very specifically as to what we do in the gym, right? Um, and mechanics, right? What, what a great, actually, um, I was just working on, uh, can I do a, sh a share screen? Uh, I hope so. Let me see. Take a look. Uh, let me go up and take a look. Let me get out of here. Yeah, and let me know if you can or not. Yeah, I should be able to. Okay, great. Um, so I can share this with you. And I have a couple other things that I was just working on. Can you see it? Uh, it's, it's, yep, I can. Yeah. So um, I'm working on our textbook chapter, and, which is our biomechanics chapter. And so here, here, when we talk about really what is, what are the principal sciences, right? And, and we're looking at, which really makes sense to me is the mechanical component, right? Physics, right? Study of motion and forces. So whether you're powerlifting, jogging, running, yoga, Pilates, you've got a position of motion and a force. So what does that mean? And what types of forces are we talking about? And what's the implication of that force on the human body? Right, right in the present moment, and then potentially over time, based on uh, frequency of experience, duration of experience, the amount of load, um, and mechanics. And, and this is, you know, for me, I've always been a mechanically in, interested in mechanics, uh, be it automotive mechanics, 
marine mechanics. Uh, so when I began to dive into in, in the early 90s into biomechanics, specifically as it relates to exercise, uh, I was completely, um, completely attached to it. So check it out, right? This division of physics concerned with the behavioral responses or the, how the physical bodies respond to forces, right? And, and, and it's like, that's what I do every day in the gym as a trainer. I, I, you know, I prescribe a certain force, a certain rep, a certain range, a certain angle. And if I'm not understanding that, if I'm not aware of what type of forces are being applied to what type of joint, right? And, and I, I mean that from not only a structural standpoint, but from an integrity standpoint, right? It comes down to, you know, whose joint and, and what's the history of that joint or, or joints, right? And then of course, kinesiology. So these are the things that we look at um, and we look at it through a principle-based analysis, right? Um, even if I go down to things like here, right? You know, when we look at exercise, for example, regardless of the type, right? Because exercise is an acquired skill, John, right? It's not, it's not this thing that we were born knowing how to do. In, in fact, it contradicts the way we do it, you know, historically, and the way we've been introduced to it actually contradicts how the human body works in many ways. So um, we look at it, right? What, what are the components, really? When someone says, you know, what is an exercise, asks, what's an exercise? Um, it's not something that makes your body healthier. That, that's a goal, right? Um, what is an exercise? Something that increases your ability to do activities of daily living. Well, that's a goal. <laughs> we get goal answers, but we don't get what an exercise truly is. And, and we look at these four components here, right? Like really principle-based and, and the deep dive into these things just goes on and on. And each and every one of them just force or intention, time and effort, they have such a deep component to understanding the exercise um, relationship to the human body. And then of course, how do we create? What are the things we're looking for in an exercise to increase its efficiency, decrease its efficiency, right? So th these are all things that, that kind of make up a resistance training specialist right and, and and it goes so it goes way beyond um let me just get out of that chair it goes way beyond that right but that's just a fundamental it's like a thirty thousand foot view right and then and then we really bring it into you know who are you and who are you today versus yesterday or last week or last month right and and looking at endocrine response and looking at uh, you know, neuromotor response and all the things that you know we, we profess through acquired information like exercise is good for you and it'll make you this, 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 and this. And, and, and the word that's always missing is potentially has the ability to, potentially has the ability to, right? And then we go back to those 10 things for who, what, when, where, why, need, goal, ability, tolerance, right? Um, so that's really the focus of the RTS and it's be, being able to at least the RTS one, right? Get that, that foundational understanding of, hey, we don't look at exercise as good or bad. We don't look at exercise as um, best or worst. We look at it relative to the things that we're trying to create, uh, the things we're trying to modify. So it's way different. You know, I, I, you know as an exercise specialist, you, you're dealing with so many variables, right? Um, when you're a surgeon, you deal with surgery, right? And I'm not minimizing, I'm just, just trying to draw some comparisons here. Um, an anesthesiologist deals with the anesthesia, right? And, and, and an understanding of who they're providing this medication for. In exercise, um, we, we manipulate the human body on every level, <laughs> every level, right? Neurally, vascularly, endocrine, digestive, structural. Um, and these variables that we manipulate, very few trainers actually have training in understanding what they're about, right? So it's important for a specialist to have specialized training, right? And, and really be able to take an, an accountable responsibility for what it is they tell people to do. 
Um, we all started out going in the gym and lifting, right? That's kind of, I, I mean, so many of us go in the gym and we lift and we, we go with somebody who knows what they're doing because they did it before us. Or we go in with somebody who we want to try this together and we find out that you're better at one thing than me. So I'm going to try to do it like you. So I get good like you. And my body is, you know, completely different than yours. And, and then we start to see how things start to fall apart. Right. Um, so I, you know, it's like this. I often say this in class. I have a large group of people and I'm like, okay, so here's a deal. Everybody gets to drive when we leave here, everybody gets to drive everyone else's car. And so we go out there and go, oh, I like yours. I want to drive yours. And the second you, and we, and we all know how to drive, right? But the second we get in it, we know we're going to have to manipulate everything because no one's going to get on the barbell and have the same barbell experience. No one's going to get in my car and go, mirror's per perfect, seat's perfect, temperature's perfect, music's perfect. All the corrections, right, to accommodate them. And so they got the car to accommodate their ability. And so we have to get exercise to accommodate our ability and not a rule. And in sport, and, a, and, a, and you know, I, I admire you for your dedication and your commitment to your sport and your passion for it. But hey, you got hooked on it because of what happened to you emotionally when you did the lift, right? So you got this endocrine response and you were like, okay, there's the, you know, um, the runner's high. And so it happened to be for you in the form of powerlifting, right? So now this became your passion. But it's a sport. And it's, and, and as you said earlier, right? It's, it's does the, ex, the exercise and the goal and the person, right? Do, do these things line up? Um, but in many cases, we have sports medicine because of how we treat our bodies, right? Um, all great stuff. Thank God we have, you know, these, these people dedicate their lives to rehabilitation and, and reorientation of the muscle and skeletal system. So there's a, there's a lot more to it. And I think to have sustainability in this industry, I, I don't think I know. You need to have that, that differentiated integrative background um, because our results are, for the vast majority of us, are not sustainable, right? You, I'm, I'm certainly not what I was at 30, 40, or 50. I'm just not. And, and I've tried to be under different um, doses and frequencies and applications of exercise, but my cells are doing what they're supposed to do, right? Through the lifespan. And as long as I'm alive, those cells are gonna deal with differentiated environment, reproductive changes as far as their ability to reproduce quickly, uh, they're gonna slow down and I'm gonna experience challenges and changes that my exercise has to accommodate and appreciate. So I, I hope that kind of gave an overview. Uh, yeah, I know. I always, you know, love just hearing your perspective on everything. And it's, it's something that I've been kind of thinking about too, because, um, you know, recently um, I had the, I'll just a little quick anecdote and then kind of get into the next part, but I just wanted to share with you, you know, so I've, you know, I, I've been as heavy as 340 pounds. And recently I, because of just circumstance, uh, we didn't have as many people kind of competing um, at the Arnold, you know, sports festival, uh, this year, which is usually, it's a very big competition. So I ended up kind of like, I'm like, you know what, I qualified for it. I'm like, let me throw like my hat in. And, uh, it's just something I always like aspire to do and wanted to do, but just never like had the opportunity to do. And kind of in the back of my mind, I was like, you know, maybe this will be my last one or maybe this, <laughs> you know, and I ended up having like the meat of my like life, best pound for pound, like performance, you know, I nearly hit all my, I missed one lift due to a technicality, but uh, I didn't miss like any lifts outright and my body feels really good. And so I'm kind of like wondering, uh, and I'm not sure if we can, you know, it's just, it's just kind of, we, we, we don't really know what's kind of going on behind the hood, right? We can't like see, like, we don't have like x-ray vision, but uh, I'm kind of like wondering, like, and I'm sure maybe a lot of the listeners are wondering like, you know, well, how long can I do this for kind of like safely? And, you know, when do I like, when do you like stop, you know? Um, so I know that's like not a question we could like answer right now, but I guess like what I wanted to kind of maybe talk about, because, you know, I've been competing uh, since 2006, I'd like to like, you know, do it for a couple more years. I don't know exactly how long, but if we're kind of loading our bodies with these heavy barbells, we're putting a bar on our spine and, and all this, these different things. And, you know, we have, like you said, we have to have a certain criteria based on the rules. Um, 
you know, what are some things that we can analyze and look at to try to like understand, okay, well, these are the, these are the risks associated with, you know, the bench, the squat and the deadlift. And what are the things that we could maybe like look out for if we're someone like myself that I do get a lot of like personal psychological satisfaction from competing. Uh, but I also realize that, you know, I do like, you know, I'm starting, you know, starting a family and all this stuff. So like, I want to be around for <laughs> my partner and, and, you know, our family and stuff. And I want to, you know, I want to be like a healthy, you know, part of the family when I'm older and I don't want to just potentially have to deal with surgeries and, you know, and some of the stuff there is going to be normal wear and tear, obviously, but how can we, I guess, so what, what should we be looking for? Um, you know, as a coach or just as a trainee, like when we're like kind of doing these exercises, what are some things maybe to like look, look out for uh, when we're, you know, kind of maybe starting this, you know, we're trying to start to implement barbell, you know, training in our regime. So it's, it's a loaded question, right? And I think the things that, you know, I'm trying to write down a bunch of stuff you're throwing out, right? You, you talked about getting older and your psychological satisfaction um, and, and, and how that feels. And, you know, when do we stop? When do we start thinking about doing something different? And you already have, right? And so when, when you get to that point where you're starting to have that internal conversation, like, I'm not sure if I should, and I'm kind of feeling like I need to change. And then the butts come in like, yeah, but I, you know, and, and so it always comes back to, you know, you're talking about, you want to be healthy and, you know, starting a family. And that's, that, that, that is like an amazing component or you're going to be a component addition to your life. And when you do, you're like, I want to be healthy, but everything you've done up until this point is what's going to determine right. kind of what the future looks like. So it's not a matter of, hey, I don't want to get cancer in 20 years when you know I, I'm going to be older and I want to be around for my family to enjoy that component. So I'm going to stop um, putting certain things into my body that potentially can en en um, enhance that risk. But you have already. So now we got to look at okay, who's John today, right? And what does John feel like in the mornings when he wakes up and goes to bed at night? And the coach really has to be dialed into, you know, the, the social psycho influences on how our body responds to things is incredible, right? Our rest recovery periods, understanding that each of us respond differently, not only from a psycho-emotional standpoint, but from a nutraceutical standpoint. Like how, does, how well does our digestive system even work to process the supposedly awesome diet I have, right? So when we're looking at this thing on a multicellular level and we look at a bench press and we go, wow, you just had the best press of your life. The question is, what did it take to get there? And, 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 and how sustainable is it? Now in sport, we know, right? In, in most sports, when an athlete is done on, on a high level, and, and you, you mentioned it earlier, right? What is competitive? Okay, so I, I don't know, right? Competitive is, I'm competitive, I compete twice a year. Okay, I'm competitive, I compete once every other month. I'm competitive and I got into powerlifting at 26, but I was a college athlete, high school athlete, middle school athlete. I came into powerlifting banged up. <laughs> yeah, so th these questions always come back, the answers to these questions always come back to the individual, they come back to, you know, the management of what are the inflammatory markers in the human bodies in this person's body look like? What are the, uh, what is the endocrine drive like? Are they looking, or do you continue to look forward to training? Or is it like, hey, this is a hassle, man, and I need a break from it. And, and the reason why we need breaks from things often is because we overdo right? You know, it's like brain drain and you're just like, I can't think I got writer's block uh, or something. And I find for me, when I correlate that with um, exercise, I'm like, I get jammed up and I'm like, I'm not getting, I can't, I can't write. Right. And my brain's like, step away, like, give me a break. You want to do more with me for your own emotional gratif psych gratification. Oh, like I, I know that chapter as I, I was working on it before a call. Right. And I'm, and I'm kind of hitting some roadblocks and I know what the message is. It's like, put it away. It, it, it's, it's good right now. You know, it's, it's good. Um, so if you're going to start a barbell training thing, you got to understand what a barbell is about. 
It's just a piece of metal. And your body doesn't know what you're doing with that barbell. It doesn't know if you're trying to train your chest. It doesn't know if you're trying to train strength. It just says that there's something that's making me feel challenged. And immediately it's going to want to adapt to the challenge so that the challenge isn't so uh, imposing because the, the greater the challenge, the greater the demands on the body. And the body is, is not a machine. It's a, um, if you want to look at it as a machine, we can call it a machine that likes to be at idle. And very rarely does it like to get revved up, right? And that's what it gets revved up for hunting, gathering, procreation. That's its biological, historical um, behavior, right? Hunt, gather, sleep, eat, reproduce. Hunt, gather, sleep, eat, reproduce. And so when we rev up our bodies, it wants to get good at it so that the energy demands are less uh, and, and it can work a bit easier. So that's where the nervous system comes in, right? And we build these neural pathways to recruit muscles to do the job. But to do a barbell press or any type of press, you know, understanding what muscles are responsible at what point in the range and at what joint angle, and then understanding if they're even working, right? Because there's a lot of bench pressing that can get done with minimal use of the pectoralis major, right? There, there are 640 skeletal muscles of thereabouts on our body. Right? It's really good and it's brilliantly engineered to have other team players that are synergistic with it, do the job for us. So it's really being able to, I think, initially start with, we need to establish what muscles we're trying to influence here. And can you, can you actually attach the intention to those muscles? Can you put a twitch into the muscle before we do anything with it? Can you actually activate it? Can you turn it on? Um, can you maintain tension throughout the range? Um, and what is your goal? Is it to is it to hoist the weight? Is it to what's the objective? And, and our, our, our objective is train the muscle, do not lift the weights, do not lift, work out, train the muscle. So just from that mentality alone, it's how do we get into training muscle group, a muscle group? How do we improve that efficiency? Um, understand that a barbell press, you know, there's one joint that moves, right? There's one joint for responsible for moving that barbell and that's your shoulder. Your elbow can't do crap. Your wrist can't do crap. Your wrist can do this or this with the barbell, but it certainly has no other role in that barbell press. What does have a role in that barbell press is how the radio, radio, radius and ulnar relate to the carpals, right? And what's going on in your carpal joints at the end of uh, shoulder adduction and elbow extension. So we look at that joint, we look, there's just so many things to look at and it's not a matter of simplicity. I, I guess it is when you, when you kind of know what it is you're going in looking at, but initially it's like, wow, so I, I got to be concerned about the wrist. I got to be concerned about the path of motion and where the resistance is. I got to be concerned upon pressing, pressing through an, uh, uh, you know, a, um, a radius that goes posterior or I'm trying to press more vertical through the radius of the shoulder joint. Um, I think micro steps are so worth, you know, looking at and in the way we train for sport often, like in powerlifting uh, is you use the barbell when you train, because that's what you lift with. Right. But in many times we can look at using other forms of resistance that can create a greater outcome and decrease joint forces and decrease. And the other thing I just want to end this little piece with is um, it's not just about the joints. <laughs> it's about everything else that's allowing the joints to move. The, the, uh, the joints are the, are the result are going to be the resultant of what you're doing, right? They're, they're going to deal with the force because they have to. But the fascia, the neural system, the, the the blood you know the, the capillary bed density all the stuff that we look at when we talk about soreness and we talk about fatigue and we determine soreness based on what we're feeling a day or two or three later and do we really know what that means 
to the internal aspect of the body, man. And, and, and a lot of people don't. And that's unfortunate because that's what's going to dictate sustainability potentially. That's going to dictate longitudinal health. You know, in, in, inflammation in the body is not a happy environment. Right. And we get obviously, and I'm far from a nutritionist, but my fundamental understanding is we, we get it from the foods we eat, right? We get it from the medications we take, high risk, low risk, whatever the reason we need to do that for. We get it from our vaccines, we get it from our environment, and then we get it from exercise, right? The thing that's supposed to be good for us, and yet we're over inflaming our bodies and we're creating other health risks in the future. So, again, it, it's a long, it, it, it's great conversation. Like we can we just, um, and still have the question as, okay, so what do I do? <laughs> you know, because go back to the principles, right? Your anatomy, your physiology, your, your mechanics, your kinesiology. Awesome. So I'm going to, uh, I just want to share with you a little bit about like what I've been doing and um, just so it's a little bit like, I guess, less, um, you know, we, we can use my, myself as the individual that's a little bit kind of easier for people to maybe extrapolate. Obviously, you want to, I guess, hopefully people that are listening realize that there's there, there's a lot to this. It's not just move the barbell from point A to point B. There's a lot of factors to consider. So I think that's a good take home message. And one thing I always learned from you, I'll just say too, is that like, um, you know, learn to think for yourself and analyze for yourself versus like, because a lot of people want this very clean packaged like answer and it's it just doesn't work like that so i'll just kind of throw that in too because i think a lot of people are probably listening and they may have not heard you speak before so i know their uh their their ears might be smoking but it's really really good stuff so i'll just kind of share with you a little bit what, what i've been doing um over the last couple of years um i started to really i think dive in a little bit more uh to the the analyzing part of the exercise even more when i i did i did do one bodybuilding show in 2020 um and one of the things i kind of noticed um you know i guess kind of a little bit by accident i know that we had conversations about this you know probably you know years ago but um my bench press started to kind of you know move again from with the addition of this you know, extra kind of isolation work for like all these like individual kind of, you know, not only the pecs, but, you know, working my, my delts in isolation, working my triceps a little bit more in isolation. And I also had, um, I have been kind of, I've reduced the amount of sets and reps and just overall volume of the actual competition lifts. So I've been doing, you know, less barbell exercises and less, you know, what I would, you know, the, the squat, the bench and the deadlift with, with, a, with a barbell. And I've been kind of spending more time on actually strengthening, you know, more of the individual muscle groups, um, you know, more, you know, and again, just to kind of give some examples for people that can, you know, so like in terms of like the squat, I might be doing, uh, you know, leg extensions and then maybe like isolated hip extension exercises, like, you know, uh, a, a back lunge and, and things like that. Uh, and in the bench press, I might be doing, uh, you know, some sort of cable or dumbbell press for my pecs versus using a barbell, uh, maybe some dumbbell, you know, elbow extension and things like that. So just been doing kind of breaking up the movements into kind of like, you know, the individual joints that are kind of moving and kind of training those uh, actions in isolation and then kind of like just practicing the movement uh, and kind of almost viewing that as more of like, even like sport practice. And I'm just trying to really just get better um, at the movement itself and using like, you know, uh, so in competition, you do one rep. So I've been kind of doing more frequent bouts of lower rep training, but with like low volumes, maybe just one heavy set. I work up to one heavy set and then I'm kind of done for the day. Um, so that was kind of the first part of it. So kind of a large majority of my actual training is, working the muscle as an isolation now. And the other thing I've been kind of implementing more as well, um, when I'm doing the competition lifts, um, more often than not, uh, utilizing some form of, you know, accommodating resistance, like, you know, maybe attaching chains to the bar or attaching resistance bands to the bar, either, you know, whether it be assistive, assisted, you know, bands or resisted bands. Um, with kind of the intention that I'm kind of my nervous system is able to kind of feel some heavy load at the lockout. 
but I'm also getting less overall like load potentially like in, you know, the, the, the end range position when I'm in like the bottom of a squat or the start of a deadlift where potentially maybe my back uh, is in a more compromised like position. So I know there's like two parts there. So maybe you want to attack, you know, the first part and the second part, but that's, I've kind of found that for me, I've been able to make progress, but like my body, like, I know it's kind of a nebulous thing, but like, I feel less inflamed. Uh, my, when I wake up in the morning, I don't feel like my lower back is sore and things like that. So I just feel like I'm just recovering better. Um, and just, it's just, so this is not like, I would say, I would say this is very like, not popular right now or not typical to what a lot of uh what is practice in uh, powerlifting right now it's very um some of these athletes is so you you know uh, just for reference they might bench press four or five times a week with the bar they might squat two or three times a week and deadlift two or three times a week with the bar whereas for me i might do each lift once a week um with a competition setup and then i might if i do a bench bench press here and there i might do a second um, so my freak, so it's kind of a little bit against like the grain of what's kind of trending right now, but I've kind of found with the miles I have on my body, this has been a little bit more of a successful approach for me, at least for the time being. So I'm just kind of curious, like, cause a lot of people think, um, that maybe like isolation movements are not, uh, valuable for, as a power lifter, or it's maybe a, a waste of time or, they're not going to have a high transfer. So I'm just kind of, you know, I know there's a lot there, but maybe we can kind of start with that. And then just kind of, cause I think a lot of people, I think there's a maybe potentially a lack of understanding for what actually how the muscle adapts and, you know, what we're actually doing like with these exercises and, and things like that. So. Yeah. So a couple of things that come to mind. Um, so back to, you know, anyone who's listening and, and kind of hoping they can get a takeaway from here, right? Like, well, I'm going to go in the gym and I'm going to do this today because yeah. they trust what you're saying or they, they trust what I'm going to say. And they're like, I heard it, so I'm going to go do it. And that goes back to our training, right? If you're, you're listening to figure out how and what you should do, you need to learn how to think about using the principles and theories of assessment to know what to do. You don't need me to tell you what to do because I'd be misleading you in many ways without knowing you, right? Without having face-to-face -face, who's my client. And I'm gonna say, hey, I, I think you should do blah, blah, blah. And you go do blah, blah, blah. It, it, it doesn't teach your body anything. It doesn't establish any knowledge for you to better be able to understand how to apply exercise, right? So we don't give answers. Uh, we deduct to get answers together through a learning process. Um, this idea of isolation, well, we can isolate muscles and we can isolate joints. The interesting thing about isolated joint motion is that in order for the human body to function, it works in integrative isolation, meaning every single joint has an implication on the next joint it's proximal or distal to. And so the idea of not training muscles in an isolated joint fashion, right? Because we can't isolate the muscle, but we can certainly influence the muscle through potential positioning and neural input through isolation, right? Neural input through an isolated joint motion versus a compound motion, right? Where we got multiple things that the brain's trying to coordinate um, and, and control versus the intention that I'm putting into this particular muscle group around this joint at a particular time. So I can share that in order to, in order to build strength, you need to build motor units. In order to build motor units, you have to have intention. In order to have intention, you have to know what, you're, what it is you're hoping to accomplish and what helps you do that, right? What muscle group actually helps you do that? So, you know, there's this idea of uh, explosive training, right? Explosive training to build up explosive power. Um, and so people are throwing stuff around and, and hoisting yep. kettlebells around, et cetera. And um, that's just called inertia training. That's, that's building inertia. That's not building control. It's not building sustainable durational power like a power lifter would need. I think for you, seeing a change in how your body's feeling is 
you, in many ways, through the bodybuilding scenario, you have integrated, have detrained, right? Here's here's the um, here's you're doing less and getting more, right? And I got to tell you that from high school up to adults, from the the two year program that I teach for NASA Boses, the exercise medicine personal training class, the athletes by the end of year one, um, or going into year two, they have experienced this idea of doing less. They, 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 they've taken the risk. They've experienced this idea of what a warm up is or what stretching means and continually come back with the same outcome. I'm performing better, I feel better. And my, my coach is like, whatever you're doing, keep doing what you're doing. And, and, and what they're doing is they're missing a, work, a practice a week or at the practice, they're giving it something, but they're not giving it everything. And they're going in with a much different mindset about how their body functions and how it works. And I, and those are athletes, right? We're talking about, and I'm talking about varied athletes, you know, division athletes who are, you know, all county, college bound scholarship. And we're talking about the competitive athlete who wants to be that college bound person, may or may not be, but is still performing better, right? So you've allowed your body, you know, you're, you're doing now what you should have done a long time ago. And I think that, and I'm confident in my thinking to say that as much success as you have accomplished, you might have done it sooner. Yeah. And you might have done it with um, more results. Yeah. And, and I, I just see that in so many people because. Fortunately for you, you're in the educational side of this thing and, and you're exploring these different realms of education and how they're all integrative to, to human performance. But the idea of doing less than what we've been told to, because whoever we've been told by, I don't know how much they actually know about the human body and its, its function, you know? So um, training, get back to the training in isolation, uh, it's an isolated joint movement. If it enables us to improve the function of a muscle group, and then we integrate that training with other muscle groups, we're going to get a better outcome. See, another nice thing about training in isolation and unilaterally versus bilaterally is you're able to potentially see inadequacies or limitations of a particular left side, right side performance. Right, and that's essential, man. When you start to see a compensation occur, and you go, "Hey, that may be just what the body needs," and we leave it alone, or let's explore and see if that is necessary for this particular person, right? Versus jumping to a conclusion like, "Oh, we got to work on your serratus anterior and pec minor because you're not getting enough scapular protraction," and kind of, da, 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 da. I don't know. Cool. So uh, the second part, I think that was that was great, uh, awesome, and uh, yeah, I, I I kind of am hitting myself a little bit because I, I kind of agree with you. I feel like I could have accomplished things sooner, but you know that's hopefully that's experience, I, right? And, and hopefully, it's reflection. It's, and, ho it's and my problem. and my like hope is that I can just kind of potentially pass down. Okay, well these are this is the road I traveled, and hopefully you can take a different path and you know get. And to I your appreciate point. you wanting to do that, and and for anybody who's listening there's one risk worth taking and that's doing less. Take the risk because you could always go back. It's yeah, not yeah, doing yeah, less, yeah, right? Yeah. Doing less isn't going to shut you down and be like, oh, I can't do more. What you're going to find out is, am I better? Does my body appreciate what I'm allowed, the stimulus and then the recovery, right? So I hope they, you know, they respect you enough to potentially take that chance because their body's worth it. And you're not, you're not professing, look, if this doesn't work, go back to what you were doing. Right. But give it a fair yeah. shot, you know? Yeah. So go ahead. Second part. So the second part. Um, so another thing that's kind of also, uh, I talked about, you know, fr frequency. So more frequent 
training is is kind of popular right now and you know and obviously you know there's things trend up you know back and forth but and the other thing that's very popular is very specific training so specific training for powerlifting would meaning that you would only use a straight bar with with you know straight you know free weights uh so there's been like a lot of um not i, I would say not everyone but i'd say a large majority of lifters will if they see bands or chains or just other types of resistance besides a free weight, if it's not a free bar with free weights, um, that's not as valuable as these other forms of resistance, um, you know, and, you know, again, so for me, um, I've kind of got gone back and forth with this as well, but um, one of the people that I kind of, uh, in addition to yourself and like Tom Purvis and others, um, I learned a lot of about a common resistance from like, you know, Louis Simmons and Westside Barbell that was very popular with, you know, using chains and, and band resistance and things like that. Um, and I have found that kind of the more that I've kind of actually gotten away from using just straight weight all the time, I also was able to still like feel heavier loads, like at the, you know, the locked out position, the end range position. But again, I was recovering better because I was, you know, getting that, that unloading effect in the bottom. If I was doing like a, a press with chains or something. And again, my joints felt good, but still, was able to get the adaptations I was looking for. So when I got to a contest, when I unracked the weight, it didn't feel like, you know, this, you know, ungodly weight. I felt the weights before without actually having to take mm -hmm. that weight in training. I kind of was able to feel that, what that felt like when I unracked it, but I was, but then in the bottom, it might be, you know, like, you know, it feel less or whatever. But when I got to the contest, I was still able to, uh, you know, accomplish whatever my, my goal was. So, um, I'm not sure. And I know like accommodating resistance is a complicated topic and the strength curve is, could be a complicated topic, but maybe uh, for people that are listening, like, I guess, um, I guess what would be the advantage of trying to adjust the strength curve for a power lifter? And maybe what would be like, uh, I guess, pros and cons of using some of these tools versus just only, um, only using just the barbell with, with, you know, reg, with regular weights. So, yeah. So first I think, looking at accommodating resistance, right? Or assistance is essential, right? Because with the accommodation in, in a region where biomechanically certain things are changing, uh, right? And, and so within, a, within the range of motion of a joint as the muscle's length and the muscle's tension potential is changing, um, and potentially it's not as great, the load is getting heavier on that tissue, right? And so if you could strengthen, and I'm just gonna simplify this, through micro progression at the weaker end of the tissue tolerance, right? So as I, as tissue, oh, sorry about that. Somebody rang our bell and I, my dog wants to go greet them. Uh, as my range, as my muscle capacity to stabilize a joint, produce force, and tolerate that force is decreasing, I can decrease the load down there, right? But over time, I can micro increase the load there. And on the top side of things where potentially I'm getting less load and more um, advantage out of the joint position, I can increase that load through a micro progression. So I'm, I'm, I'm micro progressing the strength on the weaker end, simplified, and I'm micro progressing the strength on the power end, you know, where I have more strength. It makes so much sense to progress your lifting that way because by taking and saying, okay, two, two, 250 on the bench and it's, it's just too light. Okay, so where does it feel too light? Typically toward the top, right? And so what do you do at the bottom when you go to 260 or 275 or whatever the, the next load might be that you wanna challenge your body with? You have this sudden onset of load that the tissue in that particular range might not progress its neural adaptation, right? More motor unit development through the, the nice micro progression versus this um, 
this radical, I need it now, and it's not there, that's where potential compensations come in and your body's like, hey, what else do we have to help us lift this? Versus going back to, let's isolate the joint motion, let's influence the tissue, let's unload her then the weaker end, let's, a, a bit, right? So, so let's say you wanna go from 275 to th I don't know, 315. So at the 275 to 315, we know that there's down at the bottom of the 315, um, you're dealing with a whole lot more torque at the joint than you were at the top. There's a big difference in how your body's going to adapt to that, right? So why not micro progress this thing in a way that makes sense? And so I'm, I'm a, for a particular goal, yeah, I'm a believer in if this makes sense, let's do it. And and if you're using, you know, the, the chain, the old school chain thing, I mean, look, we were using chains and, and handles to do push-ups, planks, um, stabilization type activities long before TRX was ever invented, right? And, and one of the things that we know about how we were using them in the TRX system is that the TRX system is a converging and diverging uh, uh, fabric material, right? Which doesn't give you the opportunity when you have a chain and a chain that you, or, or a, a, a system that you can manipulate the width of those individual handles and do different things, right? Because it made sense to do so, right? So what you're talking about is sensible training, right? And it, it makes so much sense to the body's ability to adapt to the new stimulus. Often we're playing catch up with adaptation and we never catch up to the adaptation. And that's why I was saying earlier, when you gave yourself less to do, yep. your body's like, I, I can deplete, recover, deplete, recover. And, and we look at it from a, you know, we don't look at exercise um, as repair. <laughs> we look, right, repair the damage you did during your session. We look at it from a perspective of recovery. It's not repair, it's just recovery. Repair means that we've done tissue damage, we've created neural inflammation. So the idea of accommodation on either side of this spectrum makes so much sense. It's the science, it's the physics part of looking at internal force production, dealing with external force application. And when we can merge those, we get a really great result in on so many levels, tissue adaptation, joint tolerance, uh, endocrine, the whole thing makes sense. That's a great, it's a, yeah, good stuff. Cool, I feel like we could go on and on and on. Yeah, no, we'll, we'll have we, to do, a, we'll have to do like a part two or what I, I always love just kind of catching up, but um, so I, I wanna just kind of give the listeners an opportunity. Um, we're gonna, again, turn this thing around uh, soon so they could uh, get a little more information. I'll include all the links in the description, but if you could just maybe just tell the listeners a little bit, let's say they want to learn from you or they want to get certified or they're just interested more uh, in RTS. Can you tell them about like the courses that you have coming up and just the continuing education uh, that you're currently offering? Yeah, so uh, this summer, uh, starting in August, next week, I'm going to be uh, running the RTS course, RTS one. Um, that'll be uh, three nights, three evenings of lecture like this. And then we're doing a Saturday and Sunday in the gym, all practical application, applying those concepts and theories of the RTS thought process. Um, then there are other courses we teach, right? Of course, we teach an upper extremity, a lower extremity, a trunk, a spine, uh, ultimate exercise experience. There's just a plethora of, of different courses. So the best way to, to communicate with us or, or at least get an idea of what we are doing is go to personaltraineducation.com. So personaltraineducation.com is our website. And there you can see um, certifications. You can see continuing education. You can see specializations that APT offers. And um, for the vast majority of practical application courses from a biomechanics standpoint, right? Um, those would be courses that I'm teaching. Other courses that are taught from a practical application standpoint, whether it be nutrition or psychology or sports performance, are taught by other team members. Yeah, thank you for mentioning that. Yeah, I appreciate it. 
Yeah, I think, um, you know, just my recommendation, I do think if for people that um, are like brand new, like even just you know, the, the, you know, your normal certification, some of the other courses might be good for someone that's maybe, um, you know, been in the field for a little bit. Uh, I do really feel like that the RTS perspective and just the, I would say the biomechanics and the physics uh, associated with exercise. I know for me, like that was, I think probably the most influential in terms of like just how I can analyze movement uh, now. Um, and still like kind of like, I always need to like, you know, refresh and kind of go back sure. to it. But sure. I do think that, cause a lot of times, you know, and we, again, we can go on and on with this, but I'll just kind of, I think, cause a lot of us are kind of, we're looking on social media, we're looking on these videos and we kind of just like, we're, we're kind of a lot of trainers and athletes, they kind of cherry pick. They'd like to see what their favorite athlete or favorite trainer is doing without actually kind of looking at um, things from, I guess, a different lens and actually kind of, like you said, like, well, how is that going to work for my body or my clients or, and, and what are their goals? And, and I don't know, because a lot of times what we see, unfortunately, it might just be for clicks. It might just be to kind of catch your eyeballs. And we don't really, un, we don't really know if that was even, if that was even really part of a session, was that just kind of recorded for, for just, mm -hmm. for just to get clicks. Um, so what, what I what, like to try to like tell people, um, like you said, always kind of go back to like, you know, what is your goal and first, and then kind of also, then you need to assess like all the factors you kind of talked about. Um, one of the things that always stuck with me was like the hot as well. Like, you know, once you kind of know what your goal is, then you need to look at like, what do you have? What, what do you own? And then what can you tolerate in terms of an exercise, in terms of sets and reps, in terms of movement, in terms of frequency and all these different things. And I think that if you always kind of go back to that, um, I think that's very helpful and you need to kind of just, you know, I think it's just slowing down, like you said, potentially doing a little bit less because I just want to kind of give some of the listeners some practical like takeaways. So I think just give that a shot. And then, like I said, you could always add more back in, but um, I think the recovery piece is big. And like I said, I feel like I'm like extending my kind of career. Again, I don't know how much longer I'm going to do it for, but I feel like I'm kind of doing things different. And um, so hopefully um, people let, will try it, you know, before it's too late or before, you know, they get, you know, kind of past their prime. Um, so that's the thing, right? What, what is this past your prime? How do we look at prime? What does prime mean? And, and that's a judgment, right? And then, we're, you know, it's, oh, I was in my prime when I was blah, blah, blah. And that's screwed up. Like, yeah. You want to live in your prime. 30, 40, 50, 60, 70, right? You, you want to feel good. And, and so this idea of sustainability, um, the idea of competing and living to be able to, right? The idea of having a family and living to be able to and, and get out of bed and, and, and do what needs to be, right? So, you know, it's interesting when you talk about social media and it's a, it's a big dilemma, right? It's a big dilemma for people like me because um, I'm not popular. And, and that's okay. <laughs> um, and maybe not even liked because I contradict a lot of what mainstream exercise specialists are talking about. You know, just uh, two days ago, I, I, I did get a comment back from somebody on Instagram. Uh, it was this, this guru was talking about, you know, how you shouldn't lock out and full elbow extension during tricep exercises. And here's how he does it. Right. And, um, and I just replied back. I said, well, you're talking about what you should not do. How about, you know, at the end of joint range of motion, if you have a moment arm of resistance, that's opposing that joint motion and you have to sustain the tissue tension, time under tension, and you're improving the strength in that particular range. He writes back, bro, nobody cares. Shut up. Nobody cares. And I write back saying, Hey, uh, I write back going, no, the only people who care are the people who care about the efficiency of their training and dispelling myths based on some exercise guru who looks big and you do look big. Congratulations. Yeah. Not taking that away from you, but your myth, you know, your, you, what you do sucks. So, so what, what I'll say to that. And I think, um, I think that that's just kind of like why I like having you on. I think, I think more like long form conversations like this are just more productive. Um, which is why, like, I think I'm spending a little bit more time. Uh, I like this, you know, longer form format and I I've been spending, you know, I still, you know, just, I kind of try to play the game the best I can while still like kind of, and it's, I, I think it's challenging. And I think a lot of people don't, I guess, realize, I guess these popular people 
um, don't real. I don't. I don't think some of them understand. I guess the responsibility of like what they post. I don't know. I, I think about this a lot, and I even think. So I've kind of used Instagram a little bit more so as like, this is my like training log. I'm not saying you should do this, but this is kind of why I do it for me and in our clients and stuff. I try to like take that approach versus say like, this is the best whatever this is, and it's hard because you want like people to click, you want people to be exposed to it, but. I think at the end of the day, it always like, it depends and it depends on your specific situation. So um, we'll leave it at that. I definitely want yeah. to um, definitely give, you know, uh, uh, a, it's AP, AP, I always, it's AP, APTE. AP, sorry. I, I know you guys just changed up. So yeah. I'll, I'll, I'll include all the links in there. Um, you know, this is kind of where I got, got my background and my start. So I, you know, hold these, I hold Vincent and and his staff in high regard. So definitely give them a, a follow and check out the RTS course. Uh, again, check out the links in the description. Thank you guys so much for listening. And until Thanks next so time, John, you all have a great day. It's good seeing you, man. Until next time, uh, stay strong and we'll see you soon.